All right, so I'm recording. I just started a new recording. Daniel and Karis aren't here, so they wanted me to record it for them. And if any of y'all watched last summer, we did like devos on the church YouTube page. Grace watched. I know Grace watched. Anybody else watch? Yeah? So I'm going to upload this to YouTube after we're done for them. So, as Andrew already said, I got it on my phone, bro, right here. Yeah. I'm just doing the audio. I'm not doing it. So we're talking about church discipline. Andrew already recapped what we've been talking about the last few weeks. I already talked about that the word discipline is kind of scary. How many of y'all like being disciplined by your parents? Is that fun? Why'd you raise your hand, Nathan? Both of y'all started. Yeah. I mean, I, well, you can't just, you're like the kids at school. Oh, my goodness. We go to school on Friday for Jesus and Me Club with the kids. And, like, I say something, just raise my hand. They immediately just, oh, before I, like, I haven't even started the question, asked the question. They're just like, that's what y'all just did. So, church, this, oh, you know that you're aware of that. Okay, good. So, church discipline, as Andrew already said, is something that was given to us in Scripture that the church had a responsibility to handle sin inside of itself. That when sin entered into the church, that the local church body, as in what we would be here at DAC, has a responsibility to handle it. And so I came up, Lauren, if you'll go to the next slide with my own little definition. This is the official Cody King definition, okay? Keep that in mind. This is official. I didn't copyright it yet, so you have time to steal it if you want to make money off of it. It's actions taken to protect the church from sin by correcting sinful behavior and encouraging the sinner to get right with God. So I made this so y'all could see it. I made this for y'all taking notes. It's going to be up here for a second so y'all can write it down. Actions taken to protect the church from sin by correcting sinful behavior and encouraging the sinner to get right with God. So... We, this is not foreign. We didn't just come up with this on our own. This was something that was given to us by Christ himself that was exercised by Paul. And we're going to talk about that a lot today. So before, so when Christ came, Christ came and he taught to the Jews. That's who Jesus walked with. Jesus was a Jew. He taught Jews. His disciples were Jews. He walked around the Jewish people. So the Jewish people in the time when Jesus was on the scene were in some sort of like autonomy, when I think that's the right word, in Rome. Hey, hey, this master's degree is paying off. So this autonomy in Rome where like they, they were under Rome, like Rome was the one that was in charge of them, but Rome kind of let them do what they want when it came to handling their religion. So we have the Jewish council, which was also called the Sanhedrin. It was the people that killed Jesus. It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Raise your hand, y'all know those names, right? If you know what I'm talking about. It was the Jewish council, whenever they had stuff that went on, they took it to the council, and the council handled it. That's just how it worked. They kind of had their own judicial system where they are like, all right, we're going to take care of this ourselves. And then if it was serious enough, it went to Rome. So when Jesus was telling us as the church that we needed to start disciplining sin and taking care of sin in our congregation, that was something they were already handling at that time. So when the church sprung forth from Judaism, we kind of had an expectation among ourselves to handle sin inside of our church. But, as we'll talk about at the end, and I'm not going to give it away yet, we're going to wrap it up at the end, that the whole point of disciplining sin is to get the person in sin. I said the sinner, sounds like a scary word too. Encouraging the sinner to get right with God. That was the whole point of correcting sin inside the church. So Jesus gave us clear guidance about this. In Matthew 18, Lauren, will you go to that slide for me? So in Matthew 18, this is two chapters after he told uh, Peter that he was going to be the rock of the church, that he was going to build the rock on Peter. This is what he tells them, talking about the church. He says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. So he says, first step, y'all know someone who's sinning. You guys love Jesus together. Me and whoever, we're walking with Jesus together. We're both Christians. We go to youth group. Me and Whitney are hanging out, and I see Whitney doing something she's not supposed to. That's what I'm saying, man. So, like, I see her doing something she's not supposed to. It'd probably be more prevalent for it to be Nate because we're both dudes, so it's more likely we'll be hanging out. So, me and yeah, see, you're welcome. So, me and Nate are hanging out. So, I see Nate doing something. I'm like, hey, man, like, go and point out their fault. Like, you shouldn't be doing that. Like, you shouldn't be doing that. If they listen, you won them over. That's easy. Okay, so we have a responsibility from Jesus just to gently be like, hey, like you shouldn't be doing that. But sin is so serious that Jesus says if they don't listen, take one or two others along. So it's like, all right, so if you try to help your brother out and say, hey, you don't want to live in this sin, and they don't listen, go get two or more people. 
So I'm gonna grab Andy, Andy. I'm gonna grab Paul, and I'm gonna say, "All right, let's let's go talk to Nate." I tried to talk to him; he wouldn't listen to me. And look what Jesus does: so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Where's that from, AB? Uh, probably Leviticus. Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy 19. <laughs> so Jesus is invoking the law. He's invoking the law of Moses. He's invoking the Old Testament. We don't like reading the Old Testament. We think it's boring. I don't know if any of y'all agree with that, but I've spent many years at Yap, KJ, and Nathan give me a shout. I think you're boring. <laughs> you wouldn't have said that if I didn't say you were sinning, hey, hypothetically. Hey, that's my witness. So, so we, we don't read the Old Testament because sometimes, because we're like, oh, like this was, well, the whole Old Testament's about Jesus. That's why Jesus invokes the Old Testament so much. That's why he quotes it so much, because the whole Old Testament is about him. So from the law of Moses in Deuteronomy, he says every matter must be established by testimony of two or three witnesses, which is ironic because the lack of testimony of two or three witnesses is what killed Jesus when he got murdered unjustly. So he's, so he's invoking the Old Testament saying, all right, if someone's living in sin, go get a couple people. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. See, how long am I? Uh, I've been reading the numbers wrong. I thought I was like 16 minutes in already. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So we don't, well, I mean, there's pagans here we, in, in Deltona. We don't, may not know about them or tax collectors. But back then, those were like the worst of the worst people. So he's like, treat them like that. I heard a sermon one time. I can't even remember who it was from. But a sermon saying that, like, we still let people who don't believe in Jesus step foot in our church. So, like, if we have a church service, we're not going to stop at the door and say, hey, Nate, have you sinned this week? Oh, you've sinned. All right, you can't. You can't come in. Like, we don't do that. So we'll let these people come into our church, but it's abundantly clear that we won't let these people lead or let these people serve if we've gone through three levels of church discipline and tried to say, hey, you need to repent of the sin that you're doing. And they still don't want to change then we can like we can't walk in Jesus together. Like this is like this is serious. So we're going to talk about this. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to build it up just with more passages. Can we go to the next slide, Lauren? So we're going to keep building it. So in the church of Corinth, Paul is writing these letters are really small to the church of Corinth. He's writing to the Corinthians. This is his actually the scholars believe his second letter. <laughs> Hey, there's four letters to the church of Corinth. We only have two of them according to the internal evidences in Scripture. So this is Corinthians B, also called 1 Corinthians. Hey, real quick. You all don't, you don't get, we, we're taking the same class together in New Testament. Yeah, we're taking a master's class He's together. notorious for not reading the whole chapter. So the fact that you know... I'm, my, grades, my grades say I'm notorious for other things because I'm killing it right now. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he's calling out, Paul is calling out this dude in the church. He's doing, I'm not going to get into details. Paul does. If y'all want to read 1 Corinthians 5 later, he's doing inappropriate things with his stepmom. That's all I'm going to say. And so he's calling them out and he's like, y'all aren't even doing anything about it. Like they're just letting this dude be a part of their church. I know y'all, y'all perked up when I said that, right? That's weird. So he said, you're letting them be in the church. So here's what Paul says. So this is, so when Andrew said it sounds scary, and this is stuff we don't talk about a lot. Here's how Paul... Babe, could you give me a drink? I know you're watching our son, but my throat is parched. Hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Yikes. So that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. So not only... Thanks, dog. Now I know how Pastor Brad feels when he starts teaching. Ooh, you ain't no Pastor Brad. <laughs> so, um, man, y'all are being harsh. You and Nate have been hanging out. So... He says, hand this man over to Satan. So imagine if we come to youth next week and Whitney comes over and I'm like, all right, guys, here's Whitney. Whitney sinned this week. We're handing it over to Satan, guys. And you guys are just like, all right, yeah. Wait. Like we always clap, go Whitney. <laughs> like this, that's what he's saying. He's like, hand him over to Satan. Like that's, like that's terrifying. He's like, are you kidding me? Like how many of y'all scared to sin right now? Yeah, that's not fun. I don't want to be handed over to Satan. So here's what, here's what Paul is saying to the church in Corinth. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch? Leavens? Leavens? The whole, leavens? What would I do without you, Paul? The whole batch of dough. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new un, unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, Old Testament, Exodus, has been sacrificed. 
So Pastor Brad said a few months ago, I think this might have even been during COVID, this was a while ago, saying that if, you're, if you think your sin only affects you, you are only fooling yourself. So like if you think that you're sinning in private, that like you're sinning that you do and nobody else is looking, like the sin that's in your heart that you haven't confessed to anyone, if you think it's just affecting yourself, the only person you're fooling is yourself. Because your sin affects everyone. Whether, whether they know about it or not, your sin has effects on people. When you make bread, you got to put just like a little bit of yeast in it. All the yeast does when you put it in the oven is make it go and expand. You like that? (laughs) So that's what, thank you. So that's what it does. And if you don't have the yeast, it's just going to stay like rock hard. It's just going to get hard and just like become nothing. Unleavened bread, which is also from Exodus when they ate unleavened bread, right? So if you don't put a yeast in it, so what happens with the yeast? The sin gets in and the whole church is affected. The church can't grow and become bread if there's a little yeast in it. And if y'all need any more stories, I'm not, I don't got slides for them. Second Kings chapter 5. When Gehazi goes back and says, and that, so I think it was Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha, heals the man from Le- Naaman's leprosy. He, goes, he tries to pay him. Elisha's like, no, no, no. So Gehazi, one of his servants, says, oh, I'll go get that money, son. What you talking about? So he goes chasing after him. He said, hold up. Elisha changed his mind. He needs some money. So he gives him the money, and he turns around. And then Elisha's like, hey, where'd you go? He's like, uh, nowhere. Uh. Like he, so he lies to him. He said, hey, you know what? Someone of your descendants are going to have leprosy forever. He said, your descendants are going to be cursed with lepr- leprosy forever and ever and ever and ever. Is the curse he puts on Gehazi. So now every one of his kids, someone's going to be, have leprosy on them. 2 Samuel chapter 12, David and Bathsheba. Nathan, his son, the prophet, comes up and says, hey man, he tells him this parable and David said, that dude should die. And he's like, well, that dude's you, bro. And he's like, oh, dang. He said, now your son's going to die. So the baby Bathsheba has, dies. Because of his sin, that innocent baby had nothing to do with what happened, but he died because of it. And now because of Adam and Eve, let's do the third example here. My little son who just walked out is full of sin. I say this every time I come up here. I say this in the middle school group all the time. That little handsome baby boy is full of sin. If you, if you need any proof, Laney will come in here and testify how he bites her all the time. <laughs> He's full of sin. He's got to grow up and repent just like all of us have to. Had to, past tense, if we believe in Jesus, have to if we still don't. So the, the, Paul knew that it was better for this dude to be kicked out of the church if he wasn't going to repent of his sin than for him to stay. That was the biggest kicker. Was that he was that, for him to stay and be unrepentant and stay a part of this church was going to cause more trouble for the church than if they kicked him out. They'd be better off with him gone because he was refusing to repent from his sin. That's crazy, right? That sounds crazy. So this is why we always talk about being like members of a church. Like that's not a big deal anymore. And I think that can be a big problem. And I'm sure Pastor Brad would say the same thing, that that's a big problem in our culture today, that we don't think being a member of a church is important. We just like showing up. And as a result of that, we can kind of just like bounce churches if we want. I'm not going to have you all raise your hands, but I mean, some of us might have grown up in a household where our parents are just like, I don't like this church. So we go to different ones and we go to different ones. But that's why being a member is so important, because by being a member of a church, this is when this stuff gets invoked, where it's just like, all right, like, if you don't want to repent of your sin, there's going to be a consequence for it. We don't want you serving. We don't want you. And that's some of this sounds crazy because we don't do a lot of this today. We've I mean, I'm not going to get into all that, but I think being a member is very important. I know y'all are maybe y'all should encourage your parents if your parents come here just to have that talk. But eventually this man. So I, I still haven't finished this story. We have an ending to the story, which is comforting. Y'all are going to like it. Y'all can y'all be able to relax here in a second. Go to the next slide for me, Lauren. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, a.k.a. Corinthians D, as in dog, the fourth letter that Paul wrote to Corinth, because I actually read my textbook. I don't care what Andrew says. Um, for this chapter, I read this chapter. Uh, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. So this is what Paul said. He talking, most scholars who study believe he's talking about the dude that they kicked out. So it says the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. So it's like, all right, you've done enough. You kicked him out. Like, I think he's good now. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Look at the heart of Paul. That's the heart of Christ right there. 
you kicked him out. He got disciplined. He did something wrong. He was refusing to repent from his sin. So you don't want him to be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. It seems like Paul, I'm just, this is Cody's opinion, chapter whatever, verse whatever, that Paul knew that this dude seemed pretty tore up. In between uh, the two letters to Corinth, that Paul took a visit to Corinth. So he knows these people very well. He knows these people very well. I would assume by this passage, and this is just my assumption, that he knows that this dude's like repentant. That he changed his mind. So he's like, all right, don't give him more sorrow than he needs. Let him come back. So I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. So we're going to wrap it up. It's a long wrap-up. Don't get excited. Go to the next slide for me, Lauren. The entire purpose of church discipline is restoration with God. That's the entire purpose. The only reason... We call each other out when we're in sin is because of our love for Jesus. Andrew loves Jesus more than he loves me. Because he loves Jesus more than he loves me, he's willing to tell me when I'm screwing up so that I can get back on the right path. And vice versa. Our culture that we're in today, you guys are young. You're not much younger than me. So... so, don't don't get a, a, a big head because I'm I'm especially y'all high schoolers. I'm not much older than y'all, but our culture there's like we're kind of the same generation, I guess. I don't know, but our culture tries to hey hey don't don't let this fool you. So listen, our culture tries to tell us that if your friends or whoever tell you that you're doing something wrong, that you don't need to be friends with them anymore. Like our culture will try to tell you that like discipline is a bad thing. Don't be judging me. Thanks for that, Paul. I appreciate that. Like, that's what, that's what the world is trying to tell you. That you don't need to be told that you're wrong. That good friends will just tell you you're right all the time. Like, that's what, like Satan is deceiving. That's like who he is from the beginning of the book. Read Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Beginning of the book. He's the king of it. He's the king of lies. That's what he did to say, did God really say that? That's, that's the first book of the Bible. He's not going to come straight to your front door and be like, hi, I'm Satan. No, like he's going to trick you. So he's going to have to, the world is going to try to tell you that you don't need to be correct. That the discipline is wrong. If your friend tells you you're doing something wrong, just cut them off. They're not your friend. They're telling you you're doing something wrong. The Bible says the complete opposite, that only a true friend would tell you you're doing something wrong for the glory of Christ, for your salvation. Hebrews chapter 12 Verse 6, Revelation Revelation 3, verse 19. Y'all can write those down, you guys taking notes. Say almost the same thing, and they invoke Proverbs, that God rebukes and disciplines those He loves. Hebrews 12, verse 6, Revelation 3, verse 19. God rebukes those He loves, that in His love God will steer us in the right direction. How many of y'all have ever heard your parents say, because I said so, when they tell you to do something? Oh, yes. Who hasn't? Who hasn't? Yeah, I think every hand is probably raised in here or should be raised in here. I, maybe not SJs because um, I don't think I've told them that yet, but I probably have. Listen, 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 look at me. God is not like that. God is not like that. God does not just say, because I said so. God is very clear with every instruction He gives in the Bible of why He is instructing us. I wrote a paper on this for a different class, not one that Andrew's in, so he can't get on me for not reading for it. About how I believe, genuinely believe that Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28 are like the most important books in the entire Old Testament. If y'all go home and read it, y'all taking notes, 27, 28 of Deuteronomy. That all of the law is consumed in the very last two chapters saying that if you follow me, I will bless you. If you don't follow me, you're going to be cursed. And the whole, there's like how many books after that? 50 some books after that? 40 some books after that in the Old Testament? I'll keep going down. 30 some books of that in the Old Testament? 39 minus 5. There we go. 39 minus 5 books in the Old Testament after that? 
And they all hinge on that. God said, if you follow me, good things will happen to you. If you don't follow me, bad things are going to happen to you. God's not like your parents. God didn't say, Adam, don't eat the fruit. Why? Because I said so? All right. No, he said, because you will die. God was very clear. First book of the Bible. First thing to ever happen in the Bible. He created the universe, everything in it, created people. And he said, don't eat of this fruit because I said so. No, he said, because you will die. He told them straight up. And Satan's entire promise here on earth, his entire goal is to twist the words of God to get us to sin and fall into his trap and spend all of our lives worshiping him instead of God in eternal torment. When Jesus is in the wilderness, he tried it on Jesus. Don't think he's not going to try it on you. He tried it on Jesus. He used the Bible to try to tempt Jesus. You all understand that? God is always very clear as to why he tells us what he tells us, why he asks of us what he asks, asks of us, almost say acts of us, like I'm at start. <laughs> Lainey always gets on her kids because they always say acts and she's got to correct some. Correct some. Whoo! I'm from, I'm from Kentucky, so I can't correct anyone. Correct them. So here's my, here's my final challenge to you guys. I'll try to wrap everything up. I'm one and a half minutes over already. There is no life outside of Jesus. There is no life outside of Jesus. You cannot have anything good outside of Jesus. Look, I want everyone to look at me, especially anyone who's in high school who thinks that they're about to become an adult. Jesus did not come and die for you to find your own way, to find your own path, to go find myself. Jesus didn't die for you guys to come do things on your own. Jesus died so we could have eternity with him. Something we can never accomplish on our own. So if y'all are here tonight, I feel like this is more of a high school problem than a middle school problem. If you're in middle school, this could definitely apply to you too. Y'all listen up too. You too, Eli. Like, God did not die for you to figure this out on your own. You can't figure out anything on your own. Read the book of Romans. That's why Jesus died for us. The only way we can have anything good, and that anything good is Jesus and eternal life, is by repenting of our sins and believing in Him. 1 John talks a lot about sin, talks about practicing, living in sin, talks about if we sin, we have an advocate, but there's a difference between stumbling in sin and making a practice of living in sin. Church discipline, which is such a scary word, exists for restoration. Confess your sins to one another. I got to watch my wife this week, who is struggling with sin, confess her sin to one of our best friends because she loves Jesus. And because she loves Jesus, she knew that the awkwardness and pain that might come from confessing her sin would pale in comparison to the glory of having a better relationship with the Lord. I cried when she did it, and I'm about to cry right now. And there she is, which just makes it a million times worse. (laughs) Like, if you are in sin, please just talk to somebody. Like, please just talk to somebody. And you might not know you're in sin, because if you don't read the Bible, you don't know what sin is. So if you don't know the Bible, come talk to a sponsor. We'll read the Bible with you if we're not already. And we'll talk about what sin is. We'll talk about what God's desire for your life is. And we will point you in the right direction. We will help you be restored with Christ. Just like we as sponsors reach out to one another. Me and Paul Mock and Eric Bass at breakfast every single Saturday to help restore each other and push us back to Christ. So much so that Paul said, hey, we didn't really talk about the Bible much this week. Can we talk more about the Bible next week? I said, absolutely, Paul. So Paul went on his own accord and is going to start pushing us to get closer and get us back to the Bible next week. Not that we were that far from it, but just make an intentional effort in it. Andrew shows up every now and then. And Andrew shows up every now and then. He's actually reading the chapters for his master's work, so he can't come. I love you guys. I love you guys enough to challenge you to that. 
I'm at 25 minutes. I'm only five minutes over. That's a lot better than last time. As we get into small groups, I'm sure Andrew's got a closing word for us. I'll pray. But be willing, <laughs> be willing to talk with your sponsors. Your sponsors love you and care for you and want to know what's going on in your life. Don't strip that blessing from them. You could tell them, I could guarantee you, middle school girls, you could go tell Wendy the worst possible thing that's going on in your life and she would be rejoicing in the Lord to hear that what's going on in your life, regardless of how bad it is. Same thing with you middle school guys. Mm-hmm. For me, Paul, and Eric, David's not here. But these same that we would be, have the same joy. High school boys, Andy and Andrew, will have the same joy for you. High school ladies, Sarah, KJ, and Laney will have the same joy for you. Have the boldness and courage underneath the Holy Spirit and the power of Christ to confess your sins so that you might be healed, is what James says.